And so this week, uh, we, we covered two, um, there's a lot here, and I'll try and kind of like cover it, but there's um, as, as, as rapid and kind of as I can, but, um, but we're probably going to be here to about half two, so I'm just letting you know now, if you've got your dinner on the go, you maybe, <laughs> I'm joking. Um, so, so we come to the first bit of, of Levi, and I love this scene. You know, and it starts with Jesus, he's been out, he's been communicating, preaching to the crowds, and, uh, and, it, and, it, and the time has come, Is like, you know what, I'm probably feeling a bit peckish now, um, maybe, maybe, maybe let's go and get some food and have a drink, let me just take a break. And so, so Jesus kind of goes, um, moves on, and as he moves on, he sees uh, Levi in, the, in a tax collector's booth, and uh, you know, like Mark doesn't like he doesn't mess around he just kind of just tells you straight what happens and then moves on right he says so he sees Levi in the tax collector's booth he says follow me and so Levi follows him right and um, I'm sure there's more of a dialogue that goes on and we're going to look at that Um, and then and then Levi puts on a banquet and invites his friends and Jesus is eating with them that's that's the scene okay and then the Pharisees uh, the religious rulers who are already aware of the growing popularity of Jesus, who already would have heard and understood the, the signs and the wonders. And I'm thinking, like, is this the Messiah? And so, and so like the guys who should know, right, because they have, they have the knowledge of who the Messiah is, they're, they're kind of asking the question, is this that guy? And so they're watching him. They would have been like listening to his teaching. They would have been observing his miracles. And, and so now they're observing him sitting with dun, 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 sinners and tax collectors. Okay, and so, um, and so they're, they're not happy about this. But why are they not happy about this? Let's have a look at this. So firstly, like there's two categories. There's the tax collectors. The, t- the tax collectors were despised and therefore ostracized by the whole community. And why? <laughs> Somebody say they still are. <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> anyway, let's move on. Uh, let's not get caught into that one. But well, under uh, Roman occupation, uh, the people had to pay taxes, which obviously, as somebody just pointed out, is a sensitive issue, right? That we, that we, you know, we live in a society that where we still have to pay taxes. And it, and it can be a sensitive issue. And, um, but obviously, like, Rome had gone, got so big, there's no way that they control it. Um, but beca- and because it was a sensitive issue, there was concern that there'll be uprising and everything else. So what they did is they, they kind of outsourced the tax collecting to the locals. Okay, so, so, so it wasn't necessarily seen directly as the Romans um, taking the money, but, but people looking at essentially their own people taking the money. And so... And so uh, so locals would kind of take the contract, and what they would do is that they would pay the tax for a whole region um, first, up front to the Romans, but then they would then go and take the taxes from the people. And to make it prof- like to make a bit of profit for themselves, because no one claims taxes just for the good of it, okay, they, they kind of put a bit, of mo- a bit on top to pay for their time and their effort. Now sometimes that, that, that word bit can be quite a big bit, or, or um, you know, and so people were kind of like, you know, so these people were not to be trusted because basically they could put whatever they want on top, you know, and so, um, and so therefore, you know, that for, the, for the community, like they then despise them because not only were they seen as corrupt or greedy and taking their money, which no one likes a person who takes their money, okay, but also um, that they were their own people. Like, like you're one of us, and, and you're you're working with the Romans, or no, you're working for the Roman Empire. You know, and and so so they, they would have been despised for that reason, okay, and ostracized for that reason. And so and then so you can imagine, can't you, that, that on this occasion where where um, Levi, who's sitting in the booth, and he's you know he must have been doing this for a while, and he's probably realize just how much de- how how despised he is by the community that people would walk past every day and probably sneer or avoid him and even that the pharisees the religious rulers would have walked past and and despised him you know levi would have been very much aware of how the community had turned against him because of what he was doing 
And so he would have heard about this person, Jesus, the Messiah, the, um, the one who's performing all these miracles. Okay, he, he would have been aware of all that was going on because everyone knew. And so there's this moment when, when Jesus then is walking by his tax booth. And, and Levi is probably wondering, is he going to be like the other religious rulers? Is he going to walk past me and judge me? Is he going to walk past me and sneer at me because of what I do? Does he see me as everyone else in this community sees me? And so when Jesus stops and says to him, follow me, like there's this, can, can you imagine what it would have been like for Levi? It would have been no different to the leper. The leper who was, who was ostracized from the community, was forced to live outside of the community because of his leprosy, that no one would go near the leper. You see, the tax collector was a social leper, that no one wanted anything to do with him. And so in the same vein, when, when, when that person sees Jesus, and then Jesus, so after being that social leper for so long because of what he'd done, that when Jesus says, follow me, in a moment, his life is transformed. He's like, finally, somebody accepts me. They don't define me for what I do, but they want to embrace me for who I am. How powerful is that? in a society that so often judge people for what they do, to then be embraced for who we are, is a life-transforming moment for Levi as it would be for anyone. And so it's no wonder why Levi immediately responds. Because Jesus speaks into the heart of Levi. He could see his loneliness he could see um, how he'd been rejected. Yeah, okay, he's got money, but big deal. Because what's the point of having money and yet no relationships? And so Jesus speaks into his heart and is transformed. And so Levi goes, I'm there. Like it's, it's an instant radical transformation. And then, and then what Levi does is like, he, he then calls like his mates. He's like, guys. Because when your life is transformed by Jesus, you can't contain it. Okay, and, and, and you want it for everyone. And so, so, so Levi goes, invites his friends around and says, guys, come, come and hear, come and see what's happened. This has been amazing. Like, you know that all these people have been, been like, have just rejected me for so long. Here's the one, here's the religious ruler who, who has embraced me and brings me in. And so the Pharisees see them, that they're the sinners. Ooh, you know, that these were, so they were like a slightly different category of, of um, you know, so these were people who didn't obey the kind of oral um, uh, speaking of, of, of the Hebraic law, right? So the law of Moses. And so they were probably not the people who would go to the temple and, or, or who would kind of like engage in the, spirit, like the religious practices of that time. So, so they were, although they were Jewish, Although they were technically part of the community, they didn't um, live by Jewish law, right? So they are sinners, okay? And so, and so therefore, they were not kind of like as ostracized, but they weren't made to feel welcome in a temple. Okay, like, you're, you're not good people, uh, you're not good like us. I mean, it's, it's the temptation of all of it, isn't it? Is that, is that we're kind of more aware of the sin in others than we are in our own lives, right? And so we can kind of point out and go, well, yeah, okay, I do wrong. We accept that in here we're all sinners, but we're not as bad as the sinners out there. I mean, they're far worse, aren't they? Yeah? And so sometimes we kind of create that mentality. Um, or we create categories of sin. Okay, like, well, you know, yeah, I've got this bit of sin, but, oh, it's those sinners. They're really bad. And so they're made to feel like they can't belong, that they're not part of it. And so, but Levi's like, well, you know, so he's, he's the worst kind of sinner because he's, you know, not only does he not do that, he also takes our money. And then there's a whole bunch of other sinners, that, and the, but they're the only ones that don't mind hanging out with Levi because they too have been 
like rejected by the religious elite. And so they're like, okay, guys, let's just hang out of a feast because here's a guy, Jesus, who is transforming, he's accepting me. Here is the, 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 this, this, this man of God, the Messiah, the religious leader who's embraced me. And, and so come and, and hang out and have a meal because like, he's, if he's done that for me and I'm the worst kind of sinner, he can do that for you. And so Jesus is there having a meal. And, 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 and that's what Jesus loves, right? He's just like, I don't care. Like, they need that. But the religious rulers, like they come and they see it and they're not happy. And that's, that's the scene that we see next, isn't it? The, you know, the kind of enter stage right or stage left. The Pharisees come in. And, and there's a temptation like in a pantomime villain, right? Is that the Pharisees come in and we go, boo, hiss, you know, the bad Pharisees. Um, and yet, like, I get that. So you can do a boo, hiss. Here comes the Pharisees. Hiss, <laughs> okay. You know, like, um, but there's this sense where sometimes you feel for them because here, are, here, are, here they are, that what they're trying to do is pursue a right living with God. Like the, to one extent, no, like their motives are like, are kind of, I'm not saying pure, but, that, but right. You know, they, they wanted to live a life that was right with God. They were pursuing purity because they understood that, that when God says, I am holy, so that be, be holy. They were like, okay, guys, we've got to be holy. Okay, so how do we be holy? Well, let's, we've got to know the law. Okay, let, we know the law inside out. Okay, and then, and then let's have the oral uh, law. So we talk about the passing down of the story of Moses and the laws. And, you know, and so they were scholarly. They were trying to, to live and trying to contextualize how they understood the law in, in their current day living. But they created all these practices. And the point really is this, is that they lost the point of the law. See, the law was designed not like, do this, don't do that, or you're naughty, you're very bad. The law is, is, is to, in, in order that we can come closer to God. Okay, in order that we can be in relationship with God. It wasn't God going like, I am, you know, I'm this big, mean God, and I've got bolts of lightning that I'm going to throw down and strike you if, if you don't do the right things. It's God is going, because I'm holy, I need you to be holy so that we can hang out together. But, but they lost that understanding. So for them, but, but to be right with God was about obeying the laws. And then they would go around and make sure that everyone else was obeying the laws as well. And if you weren't obeying the laws, you're going to know about it. Okay, we're going to tell you. Okay, and, and to make sure that you do. And so, so, we're, so they're like observing Jesus and then, and Jesus is there hanging out with scissors, uh, scissors. <laughs> sinners, not scissors, sinners. Okay, and um, and so, and so they're judging, and they're kind of going like, "Hey, if we want to be pure, we can't be hanging out with those that are impure." And so, and so they talk to him, and they challenge him, and Jesus so clearly says, doesn't he? He says like. Like, you know, I've, I've come to hang out. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's the sick that need a doctor. I've come to hang out with these people because they need to know. See, the, because that's, that's what God is all about. It's about restoring his relationship with his people. And he, he needs us to, you know, to kind of therefore dwell and, and be with those people in order that they will come to know who he is, that they would know of the love that the Father has for them. Whereas up to this point, all they felt was that God hated them because of what they did. And so it's so challenging, isn't it? Like, like this really challenges us, or me, it should challenge us. Like, who are the people that, that the church label as being because of, like, sin are, are so, can be so far away from God that they can't know God? In our society, like sometimes we we kind of we judge people for what they do or who they are, but like you know, or how they define themselves. But we should see them as as the children of the living God. They they are the ones that God loves so much. And maybe if we created a, a space for them to belong, first. 
then maybe they would be open to explore belief. But I think so often we expect people to, to repent first in order to belong. Deal with your sin first, then come to church. You know, when you, when you sort of do issues, and, and yet we, d- we don't have that in here. We don't, ha- we don't apply that to our own selves. But it raises a question, what, what, what would it look like for us as a church to create a space in here for people like Levi? For the people that the rest of the world or the rest of society has rejected because of what they've done. And what holds me back from doing that? Why why do I find that challenging? Why do I find that hard? I don't want to be associated. Sometimes it can be the fear. You see, when they questioned Jesus, like the Levites, uh, the Pharisees revealed their fear. They were fearful of what other people might think of them. Jesus didn't care. Jesus didn't care about what other people thought. He only cared about what the Father thought. And because of that, he hung out and he dwelled with these people. And, and, so, and so what would it look like for us to create space? How do I spend my time? Who do I spend my time with? Sometimes I feel like I hang out more with, with those who already know and love Jesus than I do with those who don't. And that doesn't mean to say I don't want to hang out with you guys. Um, I do. You're, you're lovely people. Um, but together, we, we need to create space where we're hanging out with those who don't know. And what would it look like for us? Not just to try and get them to come into our space, but how do we go into their space? How do we go into their homes? You notice Jesus doesn't call Levi to the synagogue. He says, mate, let me come around your house for dinner. And, um, and, and, so, and so he does. And he does the same with Zacchaeus, right? You know, we, we see this. So what would it look like that for us to go into the places and to love and to accept and to embrace the people there in order that they can come a step closer to knowing the love that Jesus has for them? I feel like we've got a great opportunity on the, on the, um, on the 30th. But who are we going to invite? You know, like the temptation is go, it's to invite people like us. You know, or to invite Christians. <laughs> but, but, but like, okay, who are, the, who are the people in our community that we can invite that, that maybe are so, f- that we, in our mind, in our mind, in our perception, seem so far away from God. And yet, because the kingdom of God is near, God is drawing those people to himself. Amen? Now, we need to keep thinking about this. And if you've got ideas, let us know and, and everything else. Like, you know, the danger sometimes of something is that you have this one and then the next week you have the next one and we don't ever back up and go, hold on a minute, like, what was the challenge? What do we feel God was saying? And, but maybe rather than doing one meal a year, maybe we should do a meal a month and just invite people. Just come and have a meal. As, I, I mean, as I say, most of you put your hands up and said, who likes food? But guess what? They like food as well. <laughs> We've got something in common. Well, let's, let's just hang out then. And let the love of Christ and the, and the fact that the kingdom of God is near transform their hearts and minds. Amen? Well, I've completely lost where I am in my notes now, but never mind. Um, so let's move on to fasting. Um, so... And this is a, a lot shorter bit, so don't worry. Okay. So the Pharisees and, and John's, because we move on to the next bit. So the Pharisees and John's disciples were culturally conditioned to fast twice a week, uh, on Mondays and Thursdays. And for them, fasting had become not about losing weight, as it often is now. You often hear about um, you know, going on fasting to kind of control your diet and, and fitness and everything else. But, but for them, it was, a, it was a practice in the pursuit of purity. Yet again, 
I mean, they're consistent, the Pharisees, right? Like, they're, they're, everything is geared toward living um, a, a life of purity, of being white before God. And so, so they would fast two, two days a week, and that, that had become their tradition. And, and John's disciples, being religious leader, uh, leaders, would have also been men involved in fasting uh, of that tradition twice a week. But their response goes to show that a practice... A spiritual practice that, but that when becomes mandatory can easily lose its spiritual value. Fasting, well, I mean, if we think about that in our own context, sometimes we can just go to church because it's what we do. And we've almost made going to church the service as mandatory. But but if we if but but why do we come? You know, and sometimes have you been to church this week? Oh no, okay, okay. The, we come in order to to pursue God together. You know, but the and and, and I, I just want to say I think it's really important we come to church, um, just like other spiritual practices, like taking communion. Why do we take communion? Because we're mindful of what Jesus has done for us. So I don't want to say all traditions are bad. But, but when we lose the purpose and the point of what they are and think, well, it's just about going to church. But, if, but coming to church is order that we can be transformed more into the likeness of Jesus, that we come closer to him, that we can bless each other and be a blessing to each other and receive healing and beneficial. Like There's so many benefits of being the church. It's not about the practice of going to church. Because to be the church is not an event. It's a way of life. Do you get that? It's not about what we do for an hour and a half on a Sunday morning. It's about what we do throughout our lives together as community. And so, and so, so we kind of discover the true purpose and meaning of it. For these guys, they'd lost it. It'd become the tradition. See, fasting, at least for us today, is, is to enable us to come closer to God. It's, it's, it becomes a greater pursuit of God to spiritually posi- position ourselves to hear from Him. When I was younger, I used to fast because um, I saw a girl that I really liked and I wanted her to be my girlfriend. Like, I, you know, like th- th- I fast when I wanted something. You know, it's like, and I'm thinking, well, uh, you know, fasting was kind of like a way of twisting God's arm. You know, it's like, God, look, I'm, I'm doing this for you, God, so now can you give me what I want? I'm giving you what you want. It's a fast, now can you give me what you want? Who's ever fasted like that? Okay, it's just me. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't judge me. Um, but anyway, the idea, but, it's, but actually what it is is about a pursuit from God. And it's to be set aside and to pursue after him in order that, that I can be tuned into who God is. And so that I can hear what God wants to say in a situation. Not because I'm trying to, um, to gain some credit in order to get what I want from God. And, 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 and so that's why we fast. It's so that we, so that we come closer to him, saying, God, I just need to hear your voice in this situation. This situation that, that my heart is, is so longing to see something transform, and I want to know what your heart is in it. And so that's why I fast, because I want to I I I draw closer to you, and I want to hear your voice. But the Pharisees, they'd, they'd lost that point. You see, if the Pharisees have understood that, if they understood that after, for the years of fasting that they were doing on a Monday and Thursday, if they understood that it was about the pursuit of God, in order to hear his voice, they would not be questioning who Jesus is right before them right now. Because the revelation of the Spirit of God would have enabled them to understand that Jesus is the Messiah. And so rather than question him, rather than oppose him, they would have been behind him and supporting him. And you want evidence of that? Look at John the Baptist. He's saying these are the disciples of John the Baptist. John knew that. Because when, when the disciples questioned John in John chapter 3, 
What did he say? They were saying like, what do we do? Like this guy's getting more popularity and he's doing this stuff. Like, John, what are we going to do? Like, we need to raise you up. And, and John goes, no, no. I must decrease in order for him to increase. John in his fasting knew what God was doing so that when the revelation is before him, he doesn't oppose it. He supports it. Because he can see that this is all the activity of God. And so, but they didn't have that, so they questioned him. Jesus, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you, why, why are you not fasting like us? You, you call yourself a religious leader, you know, or you're declaring this about yourself, but, but why are you not doing this? Why are you not being like us? Sometimes, have we ever had the temptation, I wish God was more like me? <laughs> have you ever had that? We've we'll got another confession from the pastor. You know, like, if God dealt with things like, God, if you did it like this, it would be, be so much easier. It makes so much more sense. Have you, ever had, have you ever been in that place? I know you have. Okay, don't, don't, be, phar- don't be pharisaical on me. I know your hearts, because you're no different to me. Like, we all had those moments where we kind of go, like, God, if you dealt it this way, it would be a lot better, okay? We've all had that. Um, but he doesn't, because his ways is right and perfect and just, and, and he is faithful, as all the things we said. But they question him, and so Jesus... Again, you love how Jesus, he never gives like a direct answer. You know, so Jesus was not confrontational. Again, sometimes we may get questioned about our practice of what we do. The temptation is to get confrontational or to defend and like going, you know, we're talking about you, idiot. Like, I'm doing it. Like, Jesus never spoke like that, did he? Jesus was like kind of then just goes into this story and he creates an image. He says about, you know, creates the image of a wedding, you know, and when the groom is there, it's a party, it's a celebration. It's not a time to, 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 to fast, it's a time to feast. Fasting is never a celebration, right? Like, it's like the feasting is the celebration. Now, the imagery of, of, um, of a bridegroom in Scripture is, like, is, is such a big concept. There's so much of, uh, of it in the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, Yahweh is, is seen as the bridegroom or the husband of Israel. And, and we know that in this context, Jesus is seen as the bridegroom and the church is the bride. And so we know, and there's a parable that, uh, where Jesus refers to this later on, is that, that the bridegroom will come and receive his bride, his church. And so, as I say, we can see that this cultural metaphor is about a time of celebration, of joy. Um, And so, that's why he says, no one fasts during a wedding. And then he he points to a time, but there will become a time when when the the groom will not be there. And then there will be a time of fasting again. Now, we we live in, in like to them, they they wouldn't have understood it in in a way that we understood it. Yeah, they didn't have that the cultural lens that, or the, the, the lens that we have. So for us today, we kind of go, oh, Jesus re- was referring to the fact that he was going to go and die on the cross, that he was going to be crucified and that, that he will be removed. So even though that the kingdom of God is now near or here with Jesus, there is a time when, when the bridegroom is going to be taken away again. Like we, we have that knowledge, but to them, they'll be like, what are you chatting about? Because to them... The bridegroom for the, for the Jews was a metaphor, but it was a metaphor not for the Messiah, but it was for the coming kingdom of God. So Jesus was saying to them what he's been saying all along, that the kingdom of God is near. So it's time to celebrate. It's time to not to fast, but to celebrate because, because the kingdom of God is near, there's going to be transformation. The new covenant is coming. And so Jesus, through his words and through his actions, is revealing um, that he is the Messiah, that he is the one that has been prophesied about throughout all of the Old Testament. 
And so Jesus is saying that the kingdom of God is, ne- is here. So we are in a new season. And which is exactly why he then jumps on to say um, that no one sews a new patch of unshrunk cloth and an old garment. Otherwise the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old. And a worse tear results. No one puts a new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise the wine will burst in the skins. And the wine is lost in the skins as well. But one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. Again, maybe a metaphor that can sometimes be a bit lost on us because I just go, you know, I, well, wine makes me sneeze, so I can't drink it. But uh, like, we'll go to the shop and you'll get it in a bottle and unless you drop the bottle, it, it, it's never going um, to break, right? Hopefully. <laughs> unless, uh, anyway, I'm not going to get into it. So the, but here, the wineskins were referred to as goats being skinned in such a way as to allow the skins to be used as a container for the liquids. And so new, uh, newly tanned skins would have more elastic qualities. So when the wine fermented, it kind of moved and allowed that to, um, to do that. But when, the wine sk- but when the skins became old, the fermentation process and expansion of the new wine would cause that, that skin to split. And so basically what Jesus is saying is that... that um, that the, the, the Pharisees were unable to receive Jesus, his insights and corrections, and therefore they were becoming null and void. Because they become so religious, because they become so relig- um, rigid in their, in their faith and their pursuit of God, they couldn't receive the new covenant that was coming in Jesus. And that again re- re- like kind of raises a challenge for us. If, if we're honest, we all have a little bit of Pharisee, a, a slight Pharisaical heart in different ways. Sometimes we can become a little bit religious Okay, and, 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 and it's all right. We see it in the disciples. Okay, Peter. Oh, let me go, not go down here because we need to wrap it up. But the point is, is this, is that, um, that when the kingdom of God comes near, what we can expect if we're open enough is that it will challenge areas in our lives that we may feel uncomfortable with, but we need to pray into it and see whether that's revealing something of a religious heart in us that therefore we need to repent of in order to receive the new things that God is doing. And to do that, we need the Holy Spirit. And so let me um, conclude. When the kingdom of God is near, we can expect sinners and those in our, who in our eyes seem the furthest away for God come to salvation. Because the heart of the Father is always to reconcile the lost to himself. And that's what he calls us, to be his agents of reconciliation in the world. And so let's not be judgmental. Let's just be ones who love as God loves us. And when the kingdom of God is near, it will challenge the areas in our own hearts that have become pharisaical. And when the kingdom of God comes near, we can expect things to change. And we should embrace that and not reject it and not push it away. And I feel like um, this is such an encouraging word for us as a church. I feel like things are changing. Do you sense it? There's some things moving and, and shifting. And sometimes that will create a little reaction within us. And we need to go, like we need to like work out a process for how we deal with that. And we do it by praying together. We do it by talking to each other. We don't do it by gossiping or any other thing. We just do it by coming together, praying for each other, talking about it, asking God to reveal in us, is, is this something I need to deal with or is this something that the church needs to deal with? You know, and sometimes it's a bit of both, you know. Um, 
But let's be encouraged. Let's be encouraged that the kingdom of God is drawing near. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you um, that it is so relevant for our lives today. And Father, we, we, we say that what we read in this world, we want to see manifest all around us. We want to see more of your kingdom here. Father, I thank you that your kingdom is already near. But we ask for more, Lord. We ask for an increase. We ask that we would see the miracles that we read in the, in the scripture happening around us. Father, we don't want to just theory. We want to experience, Father God. We don't want to just read, oh, that's a nice story. We want to hear um, this breaking out into our lives and in the lives of the people around us. Father, we're sorry for when we've done such a good job at letting people know that they are not loved by you, by not speaking up, but by maybe sometimes by speaking up, because we think they're so bad that they can't possibly be. Father, we pray, uh, we ask for forgiveness for that, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you would, that you would melt our hearts for them once again. Lord, we pray for more opportunities just to pour out your love on those who do not know you in order that they can come to know you. Lord, ultimately, really what we're praying is that you would transform us more into the likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.